we again welcome you for the third night of our mission. Um, we just wanted to remind you of a few, a, few, a few things that tomorrow evening will be different. We'll have mass beginning at 7 o'clock. It will be a healing mass for families. And uh, we will take up a collection at that time. So any checks should be made out to St. Peter Parish. And then I wanted to say thank you for everyone who has been responding to the call to become committed to doors. We still have plenty available times that need partners. So please keep uh, considering if God is calling you to that and to spend that extra time with him if you haven't done it already. And as Father Otis mentioned to you in the beginning, I happen to be the chairperson for the Adult Formation Committee. And we have our next event, and we have flyers in the back, is our own uh, Dr. Daniel Burns talking on the many titles of St. Uh, Joseph. And that will be at St. Mary's Hall. So please pass the word around so we can keep the continuity of growing in faith together. And as the chairperson of the committee, I'd like to take tonight to thank a very special couple who has worked tirelessly on helping to make sure the mission happened, and that is Jan and Vince Bologna. They have spent the last two years planning for this mission with Father Philip Scott, every detail to the nth degree, meeting after meeting, and then of course when Father Philip couldn't come, they quickly maneuvered to make sure that everything was in place for us to have this mission today. So I just want to say with a heartfelt gratitude, thank you to Jan and Vince. Tonight we'll continue the same as we have done before and remember in the back of the missalette are the prayers for adoration.
So here we are again with the Lord. <laughs> he too wants to go to heaven. <laughs> and this one is cold. That's very good. Okay, you'll get there faster than the deacon. Um, this is a great parish. You are preventative. You notice a need and then you deal with it. Very good. Keep that up. Not just with guest preachers, but with each other. Um, so today... I, I realize always, it's sort of, I process verbally, so I realize afterwards what the theme was. Uh, the first day, the core of the mystery is actually very simple. Jesus is God and man, and he's present here, body and soul, and as man and as God. So the first night actually was um, the reverence, fear of God, um, awe, wonder, before the fact that God of the universe is here for me. Not like my pet, like God. He's here for me to lead me, to guide me, to affirm me in the way that he wants. And since he created me, it's the only way that's actually worthwhile. Other voices can build me up, but I'm never really sure if they're going to bring me in a good direction. When God builds me up, it's surely good. And yesterday, the theme, passion, death, and resurrection, is his humanity. And we should have, uh, this is a very Christian thing, and it's where the Greeks did not get it. We should have a reverence in front of the humanness of Christ, his humanity. And therefore, realize what a gift each human being is for us. And I am not sure which one is more difficult. There is a lack of reverence for God and his things in our society. But there is an extreme lack of reverence for man and his things. John Paul II, Pope St. John Paul II, uh, in his first large encyclical said, God, uh, Jesus reveals man to himself. That's a quote from Vatican II. And Pope John Paul, if you want to summarize everything he said and did and tried to witness to, it was that. Um, let's trust Jesus Christ to show us the way for mankind, but for every individual, man, woman, and child, which means my way too. I want to know who I am, what is the fullness of life for me. Um, there's only one who can tell me, and that's Jesus himself. So spending time with Jesus in adoration reveals God to me. And that sounds like a more traditional thing. Jesus Christ reveals the love of the Father to me. Yes, but he also reveals my deepest vocation because he is true man. He's truly human. So if I want to know what I should do, what I should aspire to, um, look to Jesus with reverence and awe. And in that sense, fear of man, because it is terrifying. For a human being in a broken world, both options are pretty terrifying. To take God seriously, believing that he takes me seriously, will definitely push me out of my comfort zone. If I spend time with the living God, um, it is partially true, he will destroy the old man. He will change me. He will touch my heart in ways that I may not even want. He will ask me to give up plans that are very dear to me. So a contact with the living God can be terrifying if I'm not yet in love. But a contact with Jesus, true man, that part of him, can be equally terrifying because it will Maybe not more, but it will definitely challenge me to get out of my comfort zone, to give up plans that I hold dear to my heart, to give up hatreds, thoughts of revenge, my pet comforts, um, in a pretty brutal fashion as well. Because he modeled everything. The Gospels contain everything we need for salvation. That's not just a theological truth like if I read them, and I say yes to every sentence in the Bible, I'm guaranteed to go to heaven. My salvation means my purification and my redemption already beginning here on earth. And to take Jesus seriously, his model, what he did in time and space and how he reacted 
as a model for me is extremely challenging. The imitation of Christ in the Middle Ages, that was a new devotion, just as St. Francis brought a new spirit, taking the incarnation very, very seriously. Out of that movement grew the modern, it was called the modern devotion, modern piety. It's funny to hear that now, that was like in the 1300s, but it was modern at the time. Thomas Akempis was like cutting edge. I mean, it's almost a 700 years ago, but that's why it is almost amusing to watch worldly people get excited about the latest piece of technology. It's, ex it's not even that far away from us. Three years ago, the latest piece of te technology is now junk. It's not, but our society has bought so much into the lie that new is good, that even us Christians are affected by it. We get uneasy when we read a book that's older than two months old. That's why I always try and play songs on my retreats that are written within the last two months, because otherwise I feel dated. I like songs from three years ago, but I don't tell people that because I'll be judged. I didn't mind having a phone that just called people. And that wasn't that long ago. I remember in 2000, somebody, one of the priests I worked with, he was in Poland, I was in Germany, he showed me that he could text from his phone. And I didn't want to do it. I didn't see any, a phone is to call people. What are you doing writing words in your phone? And it was very primitive. I mean, you had to click through all the letters of the alphabet to get to the right letter. It was, yeah. Texting now is like, what? Apps. Everything is an app. We are always trying to keep up with the latest thing, but Jesus is true God and true man. It is always the same standard yesterday, today, and forever. That is Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. And we should lean more into that because the temptation in our time is to get caught up in whatever stream we like to jump into and get ripped over the falls in that particular stream. I like Niagara Falls. It's near my home in Toronto. Uh, every time I go home, I visit with my mom. And we stand at the edge on the Canadian side. This is not because I'm Canadian, but we have the better side. <laughs> It is true, because you can stand at the very edge and you're looking down, it's pretty impressive. You see the water pouring, it's literally, you know, like one yard away from you. I love standing at that point, just watching the water, and you can look out and it's about a mile long. You can look along the edge and then you see, and then there's an island and then there's the American side. Our side is better because we can see all of ours and you can stand almost like on top of it. And you can see the American Falls like frontal. On the American side, you have to sort of take this awkward elevator thing and sort of, you're sort of looking at your falls like you have to lean back. Yeah, and you can't really stand at the Canadian Falls. Irrelevant. The point is, one quarter of a mile above the, there's a point, it's marked. If your boat comes within whatever range of the falls, you might as well just um, pray because you will die. There's a point in every river above the falls where there is no turning back. Why do we keep jumping in the river of trendiness or fashion or gourmet eating or whatever your favorite river happens to be that is gonna plunge you to over some pretty terrible falls? We do it again and again and again, live, die, repeat. Excuse me, if this mission does nothing else for you, it'd be good if you could name your favorite river of death. Jesus, true man, challenged us because he did not dive into all the attractive rivers. He was in the desert and the devil gave him three excellent options and he rejected them all. He is true man and it gets rid of all our wimpy excuses like, what could I do? I was born this way, my mother when I was three, my dad, because of that I am, yeah, 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 good, okay. Why do you jump in that river? Jesus did not, and if he is true man, it must be possible for us to resist as well. So tonight the theme is, how did he do it? Jesus, I would like to live that way. I would like to live in the freedom of the children of God, as you did. 
You modeled what freedom is. You show me that freedom is not absolute freedom. That's a myth and it doesn't even exist for us human beings. And so many people run after that. If I only had this, then I would be, yes, you would be happy, sure, for five seconds before you plunge over the falls again. Why do we keep jumping into these streams that lead to certain destruction and unhappiness? And we say, well, I'm only human and hear that. And that's what John Paul kept insisting upon. Yes, you are only human. Jesus was only human. So do whatever he does. Jesus was human and he did not do that. Why? That's the theme tonight. We dare to say. So in the Eucharist, again, normal way to come to Jesus, tradition, you learn to do adoration, you come to him, you learn some prayers that are handy, and maybe if you're lucky, you grow into them and realize the words you're saying have meaning. You pray a litany and then maybe someday listen to it and realize what you've been saying to the Lord through traditional prayers, that's good or through need, or through a retreat experience where somehow there was an experience of God and you felt his presence maybe in the Eucharist and it touched your heart and made you want more. So we generally come to Jesus thinking that we made a step, which we did do, but the illusion is that we made the first step. Jesus always approaches us first, always. Jesus takes the initiative always. But so that's our experience. We come and then we say, oh, I had a reversion. I had a conversion. Jesus touched my heart. Whatever your language is, that thing, it's an act of humility to say, and he was looking for me long before I sought him. That grounds it correctly, that frames it. But we have to mature. That's like St. Paul writes his Corinthians who were his problem children. They were a pretty rotten church. They kept falling back into the old streams and plunging over the Niagara Falls of their vices. Over and over, you read the letter to the Corinthians, both of them, and it's like, wow, we look pretty good compared to them. You know, people talk about the scandals in the church. Now, yeah, the Corinthians were that church. They were a scandalous church, and Paul loved them. Note to self, you find scandal in the church, the only way to solve the problem is to love as St. Paul did, who learned from Jesus Christ himself. You will not solve problems by getting bitter and hating on those people. It's not the Christian way, because Christ didn't do it. And Paul, who was pretty close to Christ, did not do that. But the Corinthians had their problems and he loved them and invited them to do something different. He did not hate them, he was patient and he instructed them over and over and over again and eventually they got it. We have to be mature. He wrote the Corinthians, you are like children, you can only take milk. If I try and give you a little piece of steak, you vomit. <laughs> it's hard, you know? He was trying to wean his little Corinthians off. Let's go back. Okay, there are 10 commandments. Yes, all 10 of them. They're very important. No, not that one. You can't, no, don't ignore that one. That's, no, no, look, it happened again. You fell down. So he's trying to wean them off and maybe teach them a little about prayer and, you know, other things. And they keep smashing their little foreheads as they collapse again. He says, okay, milk. And he says, it's sort of frustrating for me, like you people, you know, timeline, normal maturing in spiritual life, you should be well on your way to waddling around on your own little feet and not needing milk. You know, you could eat peas at least or something. The milk is the basics. And Paul wants to give them the stake of maturing in the relationship with God. What does that mean? Well, look at Christ, take him as your model and grow into that experience that he had and he has here. The core of Jesus Christ is, he is not here just for me. Subjectively, it's like therapy. I go to Jesus, he heals me of something, some deep wound, yay. 
He helps me to overcome a vice that I've never been able to overcome. Excellent. The danger for immature people who are beginning their spiritual journey is to think, so it's all about me. And then we, that's the problem. It slips back into, it's all about me, which is the, the basic problem that we all have. The step in maturity, the only step necessary really is to realize he sought me first, that's good, and then to realize it's not about me, it's about the Father. Over and over again, Jesus witnesses to it in what he says, in what he does, in how he reacts. He is doing the will of the Father, and that does not crush him, it delights him. An immature Christian feels the restrictions. A mature Christian has a great joy in only having to do what God wants of him or her. And it's not a joke, it's not faint. It's really joy. I am so happy because I love God. Now I realize who sought me. And the best thing I could imagine is making him happy. So with the Eucharist, our first steps and their baby steps and what can you do? Don't get all proud on me. Um, we are babies at the beginning of our journey, but to stay a baby is a problem. To go back to the Eucharist always and ask Jesus for that little grace that I need. It's a bit like Herod in the Passion of the Christ. The way Mel Gibson paints him, wow, that is quite the repulsive figure because he's a big baby, he's a man-child. Can you do a little miracle for me? And notice, Christ doesn't even talk to him. He says no word to Pilate, at least he has a conversation. But Herod, what can you say to the man-child? Do a little miracle for me and I'll believe in you. As if we're doing Jesus a favor by believing in him. It's all about Herod and not about Christ. Christ is about to die. He's been beaten up pretty badly. And all Herod can think of, how can Jesus do something for me? That's the milk stage. The mature stage is to realize, can I do something for you? That's about it. There are great books on the spiritual life. That was the summary of all of them. Yes, and I've copyrighted it, so do not dare. <laughs> you can steal it. It's that simple. That's spiritual life. Either we're babies or we're growing. To stay a baby all your life is horrendous. And the chances that you can stay in that stage are low. You will probably fall off the wagon. The danger is grave. If you want to stay a baby all your life, the chances are you will probably die. A man-child, a woman-child, is not a good thing in the spiritual life. How long should it be before you get mature and start to ask Christ what he wants? Um, there is no rule there. Some people develop quicker, some develop slower. But if you are not developing, bad sign. Because Jesus Christ, who reveals man to himself, Pope St. John Paul II, Vatican II, he reveals that there should be a journey of growth. The mature saint is not the same as he was a day ago. Every day is a step further on the journey with Christ and often to Calvary, but you don't stand around doing nothing. So coming to adoration, coming to Jesus here tonight in the Blessed Sacrament, often we come to ask for something we may spiritualize it a bit, I just want to be with you, but actually what we want is a little bit of peace and quiet in the turmoil of our lives. We are really often looking more for a pill, a therapy, a solution, than to be present for him and ask him, what would you like? Maturity in spiritual life is living as Christ lives. How does he live? We can find it in the Eucharist. It's the same Christ who existed 2,000 years ago. So I found some quotes 
The basic idea is Jesus was obsessed, passionate about his dad, Abba. It's, you know, everybody has their go-to theme. I know some people I talk to, they love football, blah, 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 LSU, blah, 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 Alabama, blah, 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 yeah, Saban. I knew about Nick Saban. I had no interest in Nick Saban, and I knew all about him like the first week I got to, to Louisiana. I didn't care about him, and he doesn't even exist in Louisiana. I mean, he's not here anymore, but it's like there's this dark shadow being called Nick Saban. And, and then some people dare to say, actually, I like him. And I'm saying, yeah, okay, you're a Christian. Of course you like him. What's, what's, why are you whispering? You like Nick Saban? Shh. I mean, what is this? I do not, I understand totally, but it's like, okay, these are fascinating themes, but we speak the heart speaks, well, the heart is full of something, and we speak of what our heart is full of. Okay, so your heart is obviously very full of football because that's all you talk about for the first two hours. After that, we get onto other themes, so that's fine. I, I, I'm a patient man, I can wait. We speak of what we care about. Jesus, look at the Gospels, that's why they're very valuable. How many times they just sort of break out spontaneously talking about the Father? Oh yeah, the birds, the Father made them. Yes, I know, Jesus, could you stop? You're always talking about the Father. Yes, he is, and that's sort of the point. Why is Jesus, true God and true man, an example for me? Because he's obsessed with the only thing that really matters. The will of his dad in heaven. And it explains his incarnation. It explains his 30 years of relative silence because that's what the father wanted. It explains him going into the desert. The spirit led him. The spirit sent by his father led him into the desert to be tempted. So he didn't get all nasty and complain and say, oh, he's abandoned me. He knew the father had never abandoned him, could not abandon him, and it will never happen. So with that kind of childlike faith and trust, he let himself be ripped apart by the devil in the desert and did not fall the strength of Christ is not he's not a master of willpower he loved the father and the father said son this is part of it and he said okay let's do it until one day he had to go to Gethsemane and he said father I really do not want to do this but as he said every day your will be done. If we isolate Gethsemane and make it like a, whoa, that was a crazy moment where Jesus had to be really heroic, that's what we do often, children in the faith. Because we don't believe that he did that every day, good days and bad days, in sickness and in health. He was just faithful. And one day, it was really, really, really tough, called the day he died. but it was as tough as the day before, actually. Jesus spoke about the Father at cocktail parties, at dinner with Pharisees, alone. What did he do? He was alone on the hill. He didn't pull out his phone and start playing Candy Crush. <laughs> I mean, it seems bizarre, but I know people, adults, who play these games on their phones. It's like, oh, but it came installed with the phone. Yes, I will show you how to erase that thing. It's not that hard. No, but I might need it. You will never need that game. You're mature. You're, you, you, are you three years old or older? You don't need that game. No, but it just helps me pass the time. Yeah, well, I don't know, but Jesus, when he was on the hills at night, he was not playing his favorite little but it's free. Yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> Can you imagine Jesus? What would Jesus do with his iPhone or his Android? I don't know, but I don't think he'd be doing what I do sometimes. And we're not talking about the, the problematic stuff, like looking on the internet for garbage. Or, no, what could I do? It appeared on my screen. Yeah, you helpless thing. Poor you. Help, help. It just appeared on my screen, so I had to keep clicking. Yes, whatever. Would Jesus do that? I'm not going to tell you the answer. 
All I know is he was obsessed with the father. And when he had a free moment, dad, that was a great day. Dad, that was a terrible day. Like Peter did it again. Dad, that was very beautiful. That woman caught in adultery, um, her openness, very beautiful. Thank you, Father. That's what I came for. That Pharisee was so hard-hearted. I did everything I could, and he would not yield. Father, what can we do for him? Jesus' life is a conversation with the Father. So we see it especially when he's alone, he's talking to the Father. When he's with friends, he's talking about the Father. When he's preaching, he says what the Father would want. How does he know? Because he knows. He doesn't assume. He doesn't guess. He doesn't speak in the name of the Father without knowing. So when we come to Jesus in the tabernacle, in the Adoration Chapel, or here in Adoration, see, this is, this is the theme for the spiritually mature. I guess that's why you're here tonight. Maybe. Um, look at him and realize he was busy before we got here. Because if we're immature, we think like, poor Jesus, he's waiting in the tabernacle all alone. Man, won't anybody come and visit me? And there are certain preaching motifs that are very cheap hacks, and they cheapen Jesus' presence there as if he's just, he's like um, codependent on me. Poor Jesus, how did you do it so long? Oh, here I am again. Oh, and he's like a big dog. And he's going, oh, yes, you're back. Whew, finally, my existence is fulfilled. No, he is fine with the Father. He's a big boy. When we leave this church tonight, Jesus is totally good because he's at one with the Father, and their conversation in the Holy Spirit is deep and intimate and eternal. And when he became man, that did not change. And if you read the Gospels with that eye, look at how much he speaks about the Father. He scandalized the Jews because you did not speak about the living God in that intimate way. Jesus did not to teach us a lesson or to open a new path to the God that we cannot know. He did not know how to do otherwise. So Jesus, he does not need a therapist, don't worry, he's fine. When you leave, if you never come back again, he will be very sad, but I mean, his primary interest is the Father. He has more than enough to talk about with him forever. You're not doing him a favor by coming. And if you get a cure or a conversion or a reversion, it's not because he's been waiting for you and had nothing better to do. It's an overflow of his conversation with the Father and listening to the Father and learning from him. He cannot do anything but love as the Father loves. So when you come into his presence, of course he will love you. Because he's in the school of love, which is that eternal exchange between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, he's good. And he suffers because we don't want to enter into that communication of love. That is the suffering of Christ. And he did everything he could to make it possible. And the suffering that we still don't want it is immense. And he has conversations with the Father about that too. Deep conversations. In the first reading this morning, it said the spirit groans within us. Yeah, that's the spirit that groans in that dialogue between father and son, trying to figure out how can we open hearts? Why is love not enough for these people? Why do they still come to adoration thinking it's about them? I mean, they haven't entered into the dialogue yet, I guess. Father, I tried. All I did was speak about you, show what kind of love you have in things I did, in things I said, in the way I prayed, and they don't get it. Like, I don't know, what can we do? Jesus doesn't need you to feel sorry for him. He needs you to surrender.
and enter into that conversation that he wants to show you. Yes, you speak to the Father like he does. Innocently, happily, when you suffer, go to the Father. When things are great, go to the Father and thank him. So what I did, I went through the Gospels and found a few places. It's very beautiful. It happens a lot. Jesus prays, and then he turns to the disciples and tries to explain to them what's going on. And that's what he does here too. Adoration, yes. Healing, okay, fine. Giving you grace, wonderful. Hit the button, get your Coke. Oh, it's not bad, and he doesn't resent it, because children do that, what can you do? They don't know what a relationship is about. They think it's about them. There is a certain stage where you start to expect they could, you know, give a little back and eventually enter into full communion. By the way, that's why marriage sacrament is so important. Marriage is merely imaging the union that the Father and the Son have. That's all. Once you've done that, you're good. It's showing that the union between two people can be as intimate as the union between the Father and the Son. That's why we have marriage between Christ and his church. That is the model of marriage and flipped around. Married couples, all they have to do is live the union that Christ had with his church and treat each other like Christ treats his church. It's so simple. If we are in contact with the Father, learning how to do it. The Lord's Prayer, he was praying in a certain place. So Jesus is praying, the apostles look at him and say, what do you say to the Father? See, that whole thing, just that sentence, why would they ask him? Because it fascinated. He's intently interested in something and we don't know, he's not speaking out loud. Jesus, teach us to pray. And notice, the definition of prayer is whatever you're doing, that's prayer. So when you come to adoration, ask Jesus to teach you how to do that thing. What is that thing? It's what fascinated the apostles and made them curious to say, Jesus, teach us to do what you're doing. And he said, he translated into our words, but he says, well, it's pretty simple. What you say, when you pray, say, Father, boom. There he goes again, talking about the Father. Yes, exactly. You asked, what do I say? I always start with Father, because that's what I do. Hallowed be your name. May your name be held holy here on earth. Father, look at this place. You are not known and loved everywhere. Father, may your name be known and loved everywhere. That's my obsession. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So, Father, just as I ask every day, you know, what do you need of me? That's the question for him. Your will be done. Give us each day our daily bread. Jesus lived day by day. He did not have a place to rest his head. Foxes have their holes. Animals have their layers. The Son of Man has no place to rest his head because that's what a person in love with the Father does. Every day is a new chance to love again. And that's not a problem, that's beautiful. Here he translates for us, Jesus prayed, forgive them their sins, as he did on the cross. Forgive them, they don't know what they do. Translated to us, it's forgive us, because we're the ones who are causing the problem. So he does say, okay, children, you should say, I say, forgive them. You, since you're a sinner, should say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And don't subject us to the final test. Do not test me above my capacity. Jesus prayed that. In a mysterious way, he knew his humanity was fragile, and he said, Father, whatever, if you give me a chalice, make sure I can drink it. But I trust you. If the cross is the plan, you will give me the strength to get through it. I trust in you. That's it. 
He was praying in a certain place. When he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, this is how I pray. Jesus showed how he prayed. At that time, Jesus said in reply, I give praise to you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. It's like it bursts out. He shares something of his intimate heart-to-heart -heart dialogue with the Father. We don't have many of these. They're very valuable. I thank you. I give you praise. It seems he did that a lot. Note to self, how often do I just praise God and thank him? Do I do it after my bitter rant or before? Notice he's praising God because he says, thank you, you've hidden things from the wise and the learned. Thank you, Lord, for making it so difficult. The people that would really help me with my mission, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the leaders of the empire, are ignoring me, they're hard-hearted, they are not cooperating, and he says, thank you for revealing to the unlearned and the stupid. Thank you for giving me this lousy team. Without cynicism, he says, thank you, Father, it's obviously your will because nobody else could have come up with a group of apostles like these 12. They're not intelligent, they don't get it. I've spent two and a half years with them now and we are not making progress. And he says, not that cynical, sarcastic undertone, he just says, thank you, Father, I praise you because this is so obviously your plan, it must be a good one. What is going on here? No idea. Really? Judas Iscariot in your top 12 list? Father, I praise you because, good, okay. And not that resignation like, whatever, okay. Well, you're totally responsible, Father. It's on you when this all goes bad. Like Jesus knew everything and he knew what was gonna happen and he was not all like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We go to adoration sometimes and come and vent which is already a progress from not saying what we really think, not that pseudo-pious, oh Lord, I love you, you are so wonderful. When we get more mature, we start saying what we really have on our heart, which is like, Lord, your plans are garbage. And then if we keep maturing, we get to the point where we say, I praise you, Lord, because obviously your will is being done here. It has so little to do with what I would have liked that it's clear to your will, and so I praise you for that, because otherwise I might have thought I run the world or that I gave you good ideas. You are obviously showing me your plans are better and I don't even understand them, but yay, good. Father, I thank you because you've given me these 12 very poor apostles. Father, that was your gracious will and that's why I'm pretty happy because it's your will. Then he turns to us, all things have been handed over to me by my father. He's telling us that in the tabernacle and on the altar tonight. You know what? Everything's been given to me by the Father. The good plans, the bad plans. The excellent experiences, the lousy ones. Learn from me. No one knows the Son except the Father. I know him. He loves you. And I'll reveal his love to you if you would just let go of your little petty things and walk into the big, luminous world of the love of the Father. And then he makes an invitation. Okay, now that you've seen me pray, this is how I pray. I thank God for the miserable things without sarcasm. Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened. I will give you rest, finally. You will rest in the love of the Father. Take my yoke, look what I do. I just do whatever God wants. Take this yoke upon you, learn from me. I am meek and humble of heart. I just showed you, I thank God for you people. He thanks the Father for each one here tonight. And if you know yourself and are halfway honest, you will say, wow. Poof. He even thanks the Father for me. Like really, what have you done for him lately, honestly? I'm not judging anybody here, but like really that he thanks the Father sincerely for us is almost embarrassing. That would make you up your level. So next time he does that, at least he has a little more reason to do it. My yoke is easy, my burden light, because my burden is the only, is only one thing, whatever the Father wants. I don't create extra burdens for myself. I don't create little plans on the side. I let them go. The agony in the garden, 
He says, sit here while I pray, and then he prays and says, he models prayer and says, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Translated, it's, my soul is sorrowful even unto death. Father, Abba, all things are possible to you. No sarcasm. I know that. So if you want, we could do something else. But if you want, I am ready. And then again, he always, in these moments, turns to the apostles who are not awake, and he says, wake up, watch and pray that you may not undergo the test. Do not subject us to the final test. Lead us not into temptation. Jesus' prayer is pretty simple. He told us how to pray, and now he's telling him again, gentlemen, pray, do not lead us to a test we cannot survive. How do we survive the final test, the big test, the one that will crush us? By watching and praying, speaking to the Father as Jesus himself did. That's the school of mysticism. That's the school of mature Christians. Coming to adoration exuberant with all the damage and the baggage and the frustrations and the joys and the graces and the blessings and talking to Jesus joyfully about it all, sharing with him and saying, some things I don't understand. How would you do this, Jesus? What do you think the Father is saying to me through this circumstance that I do not understand? Jesus, gentle and humble of heart, help me to make my heart more like yours. Help my communication with the loving Father be as transparent and simple as yours. Please, I need it. And you can read it on your own, but the high priestly prayer of Jesus, very beautiful, he just bears his heart. The Last Supper in John, it starts intimate and goes super intimate. He is trying on the last night of his life on earth to explain everything. So he gives an example, he washes their feet. In the Gospel of John, there is no consecration prayer. Uh, the moment of the consecration is taken up by this symbolic action because John, probably wrote the last gospel. They already knew what happened that night, but he said there's a huge detail missing. At the beginning of that meal, he, like a slave, bent down and washed our feet so we would understand what Eucharist is. And then he talks about the vine and the branches. We have to be in him as he's in us. And then he goes off on this powerful prayer in 15 and 16 and then 17, he forgets about us and just talks to the Father. It's the longest prayer of Jesus that we have recorded. And I would invite you to read it. I'd give you a part of it here on this sheet. But it's very powerful. It says, Holy Father, keep them in your name that you've given me, so they may be one just as we are. There's so much more to say. But I would leave you with that thought. Sometimes we talk about divisiveness. We talk about party politics. In the church, in society, in our families, we talk about taking sides. As if we really cared about unity, and I would say that as a challenge. Do we really care about unity? I suggest most of us don't. We like milk. We like to stay in our comfort zone and forgive as long as it doesn't cost us too much. On our generous days, we'll stretch our comfort zone a little bit to forgive a little more than, ooh, we expected of ourselves. Ooh, I was pretty heroic. I forgave that. Yeah. But we don't ask Jesus, how much do you want me to forgive? And he's setting the marker out there, and I'm saying, no, that's, that's obviously impossible. We don't believe that everything is possible for God. We make unity a game based on where we are and what we calculate we are capable of as if God did not exist. 
Hear the impassioned prayer of Jesus, the longest prayer we have on record of him to the Father. And he's saying, Father, make them one as you and I are one. This intimate conversation I'm always having with you, make them have that, first of all, with you. That's the only way it's going to work. So that they all realize they're sons and daughters of you, as I know I'm a son of you, so that they can, their common childhood will unite them. Unity is not a project that we create. Nothing is a project that we create. And we do not believe that. That's why we can be so cynical and skeptical and not expect much more than we have. And when things go in a downward spiral, say, what can you do? It's their fault. Yeah. No, it's not. It's the fault of everybody who does not understand. Father, let them be one as you and I are one. That's the model. And once we've got that one, you know what? We can relax. Once we've tried to be one with every brother and sister on this earth as the Father and Jesus are one, good. The project is done. What annoys us about Jesus' words here is that it seems it's going to take a while and might take my genuine surrender. Authentic concern, turning the cheek, forgiven, forgiving 70 times, seven times. And that is burdensome. Yes, and that's why Jesus did say, my burden is light. If you're feeling the heaviness of that burden, and that's why you don't even try to begin, it's because you don't know the Father. And you didn't hear my biggest, longest, most passionate prayer. Father, may they be one as we are one. That is the model for every human relationship. So let's make that our prayer tonight, if we dare. If we want to be big boys and big girls who don't just receive milk and pablum and porridge and grits and mashed peas. If we want to be in the big leagues with Jesus, if we want to do what he did, there is one way. It's the narrow gate. Learn to love the Father and appreciate his love for me. Go to Jesus and try to learn from him. What is he talking to the Father about? And hear with trembling and awe and amazement what he wants for me and all of us. May they be one as you, Father, and I are one. That's what I want for the human race. That's what the human race was made to be, an icon of the love that we have. It's going to break out into the universe and explode and show all of creation what the children of God are capable of. old quote, they say, Christianity is an experiment that's been tried and failed. And you know what a famous person said. It hasn't failed. It just hasn't been tried. Maybe we could be the generation that actually tries. Father, may they be one as you and I are one. Not more. We don't have to exaggerate not less. That would be selling Jesus and his passion cheaply. Just the same. Father, may they be one as you and I are one.
Blessed be God. Blessed be His holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be His most sacred heart. Blessed be His most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit of Paraclete. Blessed be the Great Mother of God, Mary Most Holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in His angels and in His saints. May the heart of Jesus, in the most blessed sacrament, be praised, adored, and loved with grateful affection at every moment in all the tabernacles of the world, even until the end of 